All right, we are live. We'll be starting here in just a moment. We're going to be talking about safe storage for on the road. So those of you watching the replay, we're just going to give folks a, a minute to go ahead and join the live hangout. We're going to be talking about how to not lose your photography while traveling on the road. So great practical advice here on how to keep your images safe and make sure that you don't lose things. So we've got a lot of great things to cover today. Looks like folks are now joining the live webcast. So thank you guys for tuning in. We're gonna go ahead here and get started. We are talking about safe storage on the road and uh, welcome. So for those of you watching the replay, feel free to skip forward just a couple seconds and we'll get started here. Thank you all for tuning in live. Well, this webinar is brought to you by Photo Focus. We are a online website over at photofocus.com. We publish educational and inspirational content every single day. Plus, we also feature the best in photography from our readers, and we put that out there for everyone to see. And we are going to be covering today safe storage on the road, making sure that all of your images are kept absolutely safe. I think you guys are going to enjoy this webinar a lot. Thank you again for joining. My name is Rich Harrington. I am the publisher of Photo Focus, and we are joined by some experts today. But before we start that, I'd like to say a quick thank you to Drobo. Drobo is sponsoring today's webinar. We're not going to only talk about Drobo products, though. We're going to talk about stuff that works for all workflows. But a big thanks to Drobo for underwriting this free educational webinar. We hope you enjoy it. If you decide that you are interested in Drobo products, you can use the code PF100 to save $100 on the five bay or eight bay units that they have for sale. But today, we are gonna be tackling a mobile storage workflow, how to never lose another photo again. Our description of the event is we're gonna be tackling a workflow that works for all photographers, as well as folks who do video workflow. We're gonna make sure you understand how to keep your images safe, and this is for folks at all skill levels, whether you're a hobbyist or an advanced expert. We're also gonna talk about stuff that works with all brands of hard drives and equipment. This is not a specific webinar to any one brand, but we will talk about some specific products from different manufacturers that you might find useful. And we'll really go ahead and tackle head on some of the bad habits that happen when we're on the road. Because when you're away from your desk, all sorts of things like backups and things will put your photos at risk. So we got a lot of things we're gonna cover. We're gonna talk about travel scenarios, why you back up while traveling, what gear you need for field backups, choosing the right type of connection for your drive, how to keep everything safe while traveling, making a verified copy so you don't lose any data, how to create a dedicated catalog with Lightroom so that you can make a standalone catalog in the field and then merge it when you get back. So I'm really looking forward to Levi Sim showing that workflow. I'll talk about using Adobe Bridge and Camera Raw to make edits right to the card itself and sidecar files before you import to Lightroom. Plus, we'll talk about doing some things to the cloud, traveling internationally, and our old friend 321 Backup. Now, my name is Rich Harrington. I am your host, and we are joined by photographer Levi Sim and Mark Fuccio, who is a storage expert. Let's start with Levi. Levi, can you give folks just a little bit about your background? Sure. I'm a full-time photographer. I live in Portland, Oregon. I, uh, I primarily photograph people for a living, but I love to photograph everything, and I travel quite a lot. I, uh, it seems like about twice a month I'm on the road photographing for clients or, or teaching other photographers. And In fact, I just got back from Utah, and I've, I've got some, some tips to share with you about how to keep things together. Um, I'm also an educator and, and a, a Lightroom uh, educator as well, so there are some great tools built in that we can maximize for uh, keeping things safe and flowing well. And I, I just, I love, I love making pictures and, and I love helping others make their pictures better too. Excellent, Levi. I'm looking forward to hearing your advice later today. And uh, folks, Levi is also the co-host of the Photo Focus Lightroom Hangout. So if you want to learn more about Lightroom, be sure to check that out. And joining us is our good friend, Mark Fuccio, who is a storage expert. He knows all things about storage. And I would say that he's probably talked to more photographers, both in panic mode and in just everyday how to be more prepared mode. So Mark, give us just a little bit about your background, and then we'll jump right into our program. Yes. Hi, Rich. Uh, thanks for the invitation. It's great to be here today. Um, I live in Silicon Valley. I've been involved with uh, different types of storage for a long time. Uh, most recently, I've been doing a lot of work with uh, Drobo, 
And uh, I'm sure they're very familiar to uh, you know, the people who are listening. Uh, but uh, sort of my background spans from the high end of enterprise storage, you know, network attached storage systems that sell for hundreds of thousand dollars or more, um, you know, software solutions uh, in very specific virtualization uh, environments. Uh, and the most uh, fun thing about Drobo is it really is at a price point that appeals to a very large audience. So um, it's, it's a great, uh, great system and uh, look forward to sharing little bits and pieces of knowledge about that uh, in the seminar today. Excellent. Well, we're going to start things out by talking about some common travel scenarios. Why do we hit the road? And uh, this is going to be mostly common sense, but I want you to make sure you really think through some of the issues. So the, the first one here that I find is that we're traveling for clients. You know, we're specifically on the road taking pictures for those clients. And at this point, what I'm going to say is having to sleep in an uncomfortable bed and eat bad food is no excuse to still not do your job. Uh, you know, if you are traveling for work, you're going to have to lug some extra equipment with you. If you're getting paid for those pictures, getting them home safely, getting to the client's pretty important. So Levi, what are a couple things you've either learned the hard way or mantras that you swear by? I'm going to get to some specifics on gear in a moment, but I guess I would say for me, it's backup as you go. Don't wait to the end of the shoot day to do the first backup. Yeah, absolutely. Because you, you, at the end of the day, you're tired and people want to go home and you get back to your hotel and it's, yeah, if, if you can back up as you go, it's so much better. Um, I also... I have I have things in place in my bags so that I know every time this this piece goes here and this piece goes there and if that spot is empty then I'm missing something um, especially hard drives the hard drives go in this top right corner of my bag and if there aren't two two little red bags in there then I'm 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 looking for something and I've I've also created a habit of triple checking every time I leave an airplane I have left this little guy on airplanes twice. <laughs> You'd think once would be enough, but you're tired. You know, it's a red eye flight and you were, you were backing up stuff on the plane or you were, you were starting to sort pictures for a client. And uh, this little guy just fits so nicely in that seat back pocket. That it, it, it does, Lee, but I leave. believe I learned this from you. I'm, I'm going right. to cover up my mobile phone number there so nobody rings it off the hook. <laughs> but uh, reward if found, my name and a phone number, and yeah. I have been called. I have been paged in the airport for leaving it as the cleaning crew's finding it. People, <laughs> if they find something with a name on it on a phone number, they don't have – an excuse not to reach. Like if you just find something that's lost, it's pretty easy to say, well, if I turn it into lost and found, you know, it's just going to get recycled anyways, or somebody's just going to take it out of the lost and found, right. you know, but if it's got a name and a phone number, they, they, they basically have to go through this moral dilemma of, Oh, I guess I am stealing if I don't return this. All right. A couple of you have figured right. it out. Feel free to use the chat pod there, Matthew and Andrew. Thank you for checking in. Uh, we will be giving away uh, a couple of pieces of software later today from some of our, our partners over at Photo Focus. And uh, if you didn't catch it earlier, if you use the code PF100, you can save $100 on a Trobo, Drobo. So thanks for that today. Well, another scenario that happens a lot is traveling for fun. Uh, we're going to go out there and we're traveling to take pictures. And, you know, this really happens. And, and here's one that I've learned the hard way. Sometimes when I'm out in the field shooting, or if I haven't paid attention or somebody else touched my camera, I'm going to blame it on somebody else or, you know, who knows? <laughs> uh, I've gone for more than one day shooting JPEG only. Uh, and, you know, by not checking my pictures, I have, you know, these great images that are not bad, but the flexibility of raw is lost. Or I found that I had a bad memory card and I didn't know. And so I, I like to check periodically. I also don't put all my eggs in one basket. Mark, you know, when you're on the road here, you know, probably the last thing you think about is backing up storage. But is there a, is there a good time to do it? Is it the sort of thing, you know, hey, pour yourself a glass of wine and, and set up the copy before you go to dinner each night? Any practical advice you could throw out there to make it a habit? Yes, I think the key thing is in making a habit so that's something uh, that's part of your workflow. And if it is a habit, if you don't do it, something, something will feel a little bit off. Your body or mind will give you a reminder. Uh, what I've done is uh, some, of the, some of the video shoots I've been on on traveling on location is uh, the video crew will make a point that uh, every time a card is filled, 
you know, they will back it up right then and there. You know, so the benefit is that uh, it's getting backed up. Then they have the copy both on, you know, on a computer, you know, and, uh, you know, the card itself. And those cards get uh, saved. They're not reused. They're not site recycled out in the field. So I think it's important to have ample storage for everything so that uh, if you're in the field, you're under pressure, uh, maybe you didn't get a good night's sleep. That's when mistakes get made. And mistakes are the leading cause of data loss in my experience. Absolutely. And you mentioned, you know, traveling in the field, having enough cards. I always end up taking two card wallets. We'll talk more about these later. But I put a full one in my right pocket and an empty one in my left pocket when I start the day. So people are like, well, why do you bring an empty card wallet? But as I fill up memory cards, I move them into the left one. Some people say, oh, you put it in there upside down, but you drop this. It's hard to tell what's upside down and right side up, particularly if they're SD cards and they pop out. So I know that the ones in my right pocket are the right ones to use, and the ones in my left pocket are to be left alone because they're full. Now, another scenario, of course, is an extended travel situation, and this is when it just becomes critical. I've often been on the road for many weeks at a time, and you have to now start thinking about theft and other issues. And in this case, you might want to start, you know, backing up to the cloud each night or shipping. Levi, you often hit the road for long periods of time. You know, do you find yourself doing uploads or uh, even shipping a drive off to a client midway through a big trip before you hit airport number seven? Yeah, definitely. Um, and then you've you've got to have you've got to have backups on your person. And so I have two drives with everything on it and I can, I can send one of those off. I can ship one in my luggage and one on my person. If, if I've got this, this drive in my backpack and my backpack gets left on an airplane, I won't say stolen because it's probably going to be my mistake. <laughs> but if, if I leave my backpack someplace, um, then, then I've lost everything. So you've got to have two copies for sure. And then shipping, it's a great idea. It's, it's peace of mind that you're paying for and it, you know, 20 bucks to ship something. Yeah. Right. So I would interject here. It sounds like you're practicing a variant of sort of the three, two, one strategy, which is even though you're on the which road, we're going to talk more about this. yes, yeah. Yeah. but you know, here you're making sure that you have three copies of your data, you know, one in your luggage, one in your camera kit, one in your person. So that, uh, exactly. yeah. you, know, no, you know, two things, three things bad have to happen before you're, you know, you're without the data, which is, it's possible, but that's very, very, very unlikely. But lost luggage, <laughs> how often, how many people have not had an you know, airplane lose their luggage? So you don't yes. want, you, you need to have another copy of your data. So you're not, uh, you know, basically, uh, you know, injured and screwed by having uh, something like that happen. Mm -hmm. Well, good. And uh, we actually got our first question. Matthew said, have you ever had any problems taking a hard drive? I understand China is sensitive about them. You know, if you take them through border control, um, you know, this is why you might want to put them in multiple places, one inside the suitcase, one on your person. So if they do take it, it's not everything. Now, I find that if I travel, I'm a member of ASMP. So I actually registered, have a proper press pass. I can provide credentials when traveling. Uh, if you're traveling for personal use, you know, then, you know, then you want to go simple, you know, don't have some giant Pelican case, just get some consumer off the shelf thing that looks like this, you know, these can hold hard drives, help keep them safe. They're not going to know the difference between this and an electric razor. You're going to have to really invoke some suspicion before they start unzipping every single pouch. The other thing that you can do is minimize how many things you put through uh, the scanner at once. Now we'll talk more about airports and international a little bit later. But our next thing is sort of why backup, why traveling? And uh, basically, because you're not going to get a second chance. So what this comes down to is sometimes your clients are going to require it. So make sure you check if this is a requirement of the contract. We already mentioned that nothing beats peace of mind. You don't want to lose those images on the road. And there are many different data loss events. We've already talked about several. You can have theft. You can have lost baggage. You can have, you know, late night, this person brings in your room service and spills a carafe of water across the desk and fries everything. I have had that happen. So having more than one copy is really pretty important, which leads us to some of the backup equipment. So there are some things that are pretty essential. First up, dedicated card readers, followed by at least two hard drives, memory card storage cases, power strip, we'll talk about that, but for surge protection, very important, 
and potentially raid. So first up, card readers. Now, we all have our favorites. There's many different ones out there. Um, I'm going to hold up to, I don't know, Levi, if you did any show and tell. It's always fun with photographer show and tell day. You know, what's, it, right. what's in your bag? It, I swear to gosh, we do this at conferences. Ooh, that's neat. Where'd you get that? <laughs> so here's my two favorite travel <clears throat> card readers. These are both nice on screen. I use the Hoodman as a desk. I've had good luck with Transcend. But here's just one off of Amazon. This one's from a company called Inland. And it's USB 3, and it basically has like one of everything. So you've got your micro, your SD, you've got other styles on here. You know, the only thing this doesn't do is compact flash. Uh, on the other hand, you know, if I just need micro SD, I really like this one from Hoodman. It's USB 3. It looks just like a thumb drive, but the card actually just sticks in right in the side. And you might be saying, well, doesn't my laptop have a built-in reader? Yes, and apparently Apple and others are thinking that they should kill that in the next version, and they put the cheap ones in that aren't very fast to begin with. So I think it's important to bring your own. Levi, you got any advice here? Mark, anything to look on for connection types? Let's start with Levi. Yeah, I, I did verify with uh, with our pal Mikey Lou, who who works at the Apple store. He verified that the uh, the card reader in my MacBook from at least 2012 and newer is U USB 3. So it's it's pretty fast, but it's not the latest uh, UHS thingy. <laughs> so it's not the latest ratings, but yeah. it's it's actually the one I use most of the time because I'm doing because I'm 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 using photography and I'm probably only filling one or two cards a day. Not um, not a whole lot like you do with video. Well, I, sh I, sh I shoot time lapse yeah, and panorama and, and HDR, so yeah, apparently exactly. I'm addicted to buying memory cards. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and, and you want to be able to if you use a memory card reader, you can also download more than one card at one time, and that speeds everything up. Um, importantly, I like that reader you held up and and these on screen because they have cords. I don't love the ones that plug directly into my USB because they keep me from plugging something else into the USB right next to it. Uh, so that's that's something to consider is what kind of real estate on my physical computer is it taking up. Mark, I, I also have the Lexar USB 3 reader. But. Very cool. Mark, any advice there on connection types or things to think about with card readers? Yes, I would. I think the, the point would be to do a uh, redundancy that you, just because your Mac may have a card reader built in, I've been on situations where the card reader is broken or for whatever reason would refuse to read the card. Uh, the day was saved by having something that would plug into the USB 3 slot. So again, I think part of this is uh, you know, one of the recurring themes that we're talking about is avoid single point of failure, whereas it be a hard drive, a card reader, a cable, a power supply, you know, things like that. Uh, always have a little bit of redundancy just to eliminate the risk that you know, something uh, fails. Very cool. Yeah. Also, on the on the built-in on the MacBook, if you're if yours is being intermittent, if it sometimes reads a card and sometimes doesn't, take a big breath and blow it out, or get some right. canned air. There's there's lint jam down in there. <laughs> right. The, the other thing the other thing is uh, also uh, especially for people who do uh, you know uh, bigger shoots, uh, spend a couple dollars more and get a faster card. Uh, because your time is, is your, your time is well worth it, and especially if you're out in the field where every second counts. You know, if you have a plane to catch and you're worried about, you know, why isn't this backup going? You know, you know that's worth you know, more than a couple dollars. That it, you know, avoiding that is worth more than a couple dollars that it spends to buy a faster reader. Absolutely. All right. Another thing is, is traveling with at least two hard drives. In this case, I'm showing my typical scenario. I'll travel with it one to two bus powered hard drives. And then if I'm going to be traveling for more than just an overnight trip, I bring my Drobo Mini. And what I like about the Drobo Mini is that it actually has four drives in it. So to give you an idea on size, this is about the size of the Drobo Mini. It's a little thicker, you know, sort of like a portable DVD player. And this is the travel case. It's got the cords in it, the device, everything else. What I like about this is that it actually has a built-in battery backup. So if it's on set and for some reason somebody kicks the power, it's going to finish the transfer. And it's a RAID, meaning that I can actually put multiple drives in. So multiple drives can fail here without a point of data loss. Now, Mark, we'll talk more about RAID and everything else here in a sec, but you know, why is it important to consider having more than one? This unit was designed specifically for the field. 
Uh, this has been in the Drobo lineup for a while now. Uh, you can still find it at Drobo and at other retailers. But you know, why might you travel with RAID? Also, other manufacturers like GTEC have rated drives for performance, or you can restripe those for redundancy. So the key reason is that RAID offers you protection against data loss in the event of a hard drive failure. Uh, some RAIDs, like the Drobo Mini, you can configure to protect against two hard drive failures. And that's important because by definition, if you're out and you're traveling, uh, you're putting your systems through a much wider uh, you know, environmental uh, you know, uh, experience and much riskier environment than if it's just sitting on a desktop. So uh, that's uh, part of the reason for thinking about RAID. You know, also, if you're, if you're doing uh, you know, a project for a client instead of just for fun, um, the client may not you know, think of specifying that uh, your data is stored redundantly, but uh, guarantee if you lose data, you'll never get another job from that client. You know, or, or the way the industry talks or and their the friends sports goes around, <laughs> yeah, they're going or to tell friends. friends and friends and friends. So, um, you know, it, you know, footage and your know, content is irreplaceable. So uh, you really need to protect it. And, uh, that's the that that's the that's the bottom line reason. Yep, and I, I agree. Also, with I, go ahead, Levi. I, I love that mini or, or or any of the RAID devices because I can pop. I in in my mini, I just have two drives in there, and so I I just pop one out and put it in my carry on and put the other in my checked baggage so that I'm uh, again I've got that redundancy in two places. And then when I get home, I just put them both back in. And if if I lost if I lost one of them uh, during my travel, I just get another Drobo Mini and put it back in, and it's got everything to it. It's got everything built in. Um, the identity oh, of my Mini is only, actually saved on that drive. Yeah, that's only if the Mini gets uh, gets stolen. If, if the drive, if you lose the drive, you just you know, go to Amazon or B and H or wherever and buy another replacement drive. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Good. That's that's a, that's that's a really great tip of you know, using it to get RAID for redundancy and separating the drives, and you have uh, you know you have physical you know and transport redundancy as well. Good. Mm -hmm. Well, we mentioned these before. The, this is my favorite brand, the Pelican hard cases. I don't care what you use, but something that keeps the card safe that can stand up to baggage handlers, to that person. <laughs> My favorite is, is, you know, you've gotten on the plane, you've paid for early boarding, or you did the upgrade seat, you put your bag in the overhead, and then some Yahoo comes and tries shoving stuff, and they just start smashing down your camera bag. They do all sorts of stuff. I've just found that I gotta put anything that doesn't need to get damaged in a hard case. So I would strongly suggest looking at that. Uh, another yeah. thing that's pretty important is power supplies. Uh, a lot of times if I'm traveling and I'm in hotels, especially internationally, I need to be mindful for surge protection. So the one on the left here will allow you to plug in three items and some USB. Fellows does one. Here's a, another one that I like. This one here is uh, from the folks over at Monster, and it just folds onto itself, but it's a nice four-outlet power strip. And these are really important because... Hotel power is very subject to brownouts and other things. And international, it's worse. Mark, what's the danger of power fluctuations while you're in the middle of making copies, both to the drives and to potentially the copies? So the danger of uh, power fluctuation uh, transcends just the hard drive. You d depending on the nature of the surge and if it's uh, very sudden, you get very high voltages, it can actually uh, you destroy or damage equipment. So... You know, you're at more more at more risk than just uh, losing data or having a data you know uh, corrupted. Uh, you could actually uh, have drives fail. Uh, the other point I'd make is that uh, depending on where you travel, uh, I'm sure we've all been into hotel rooms where we basically rewire it, right? We're pulling all the all the yeah. furniture out so that we can find additional uh, additional outlets to plug things into. You know, I think that's right. that's the key reason you should bring your own power supply. Sorry, your own power strip, so that you have you know additional taps, uh, you know, if needed. Because the gear doesn't take a lot of uh, amperage. It's just you know you need a lot of lots to you know plug things into. Levi, you seem like you got any yeah, advice here. Yeah, I've got two other ideas about it too. Yeah. Um, when you're at the airport, you're a lot more popular if you can <laughs> expand the power taps rather than oh, use yeah. them all up. So so bringing, bringing at least a three tap, uh, a, a three prongs. Uh, 
Levi. device with you. It's, it's really a nice way to go. Have you ever gotten a cookie or a bag of M and M's for being a good guy, Levi? <laughs> <laughs> I I got treated to the uh, to the sweet to the uh, what is it the the freak the uh, the Delta. The Sky Lounge? <laughs> Sweet. Yeah, the Sky Lounge. Yeah, somebody, somebody took me to the Sky Lounge. Said, Man, that was that was great. Thanks a lot. Hey, you want to join me in the Sky Lounge? Um, and then also, when you're actually on the plane itself, the there, there's an outlet often on the plane, but it's it's an international layout, and it's usually very loose. My my MacBook plug will not stay in there, but I've got a little a little three three headed uh, adapter that goes in tightly. And if it's not fitting tightly, you can bite on the prongs and just bend them a little snugger, yes. <laughs> and and it'll fit right in. And then your your other devices fit snugly to that as well. Nice, nice. Well, we had a couple of questions. Remember, if you're watching over on the YouTube page, you can put questions there into the comment section. We'll see that pop up here. Uh, Andrew asked one about online backup services like Backblaze. We are going to talk about online backup and cloud backup while on the road in just a moment. Uh, the short version is, is your experiences will vary greatly. I've seen hotels often have blazing fast internet down, but terrible upload speed. So it's going to really depend on where you're at. But if the connection type's good, go for it. Uh, and then Ken also asked about backing up on the road without a laptop. Uh, I have done this before. There are a series of dedicated devices that have internal hard drives where you can slip things in and that works quite well. I would like to make one other possible suggestion though as an alternative. And that is I've actually started traveling oftentimes with a Microsoft Surface, a tablet. And there are other tablets out there that have the full operating system, runs the full version of Lightroom and Bridge, and has a USB 3 port. So it's very easy to plug in a drive and plug in other things. Now, that's still traveling with the device, but it's not you know, much better battery life, much smaller footprint than traveling with a laptop, much lower price point. Uh, but there are dedicated hardware devices out there. They tend to be pretty expensive, but they do work. The other thing you can also consider uh, most hotels have a business center, so if you travel with a card reader and you're really hard up, your laptop goes down, you're lost, I have had to go to a business center and sit there and copy files. And so you can consider that. Idea. So it's, a, it's usually not a pleasant experience, but it's better than not being backed up. All right, well, the next one is our connection type. Oh, also, real, go ahead, yes, Aluda. real quick on that one, Rich, um, many of our cameras have dual card ports. And so just buy an extra card and shoot to both cards, mirroring those cards in your camera, and, and you've, got a, you've got at least one backup right there. Very good tip, Levi. Yes, very good tip. Now, sometimes you do have to choose the connection option for how you're going to put these drives together. And uh, there's a lot of choices out there. These days, it really comes down to three that are used most often. Thunderbolt, USB 3, and USB-C. Now, let's talk about the middle one there for a second, USB 3. This one is kind of nice to have on a lot of devices because it's really backwards compatible, right, Mark? Like, it's going to work on USB 2. It'll even work really slowly on USB 1. So I usually bring at least one USB 3 hard drive So because it tends to work with anything I encounter. Any, any take on that? Yeah, so the thing to think about, you know, USB is you know, we're all familiar with the uh, – you know, uh, host side, you know, that's that square rectangular pin that goes in. And depending on uh, the generation, you know, there's more uh, of those lines are used for uh, data and signal transfer. The, so the, USB, are, the USB 3 ones tend to be blue on the inside. If you're shopping for accessories and you don't pay attention to that, that's the faster type. Yes, that's, that's, that's correct. You know, be, and it is colored blue. I believe that's even part of the spec because uh, people need a visual aid to identify it because it's the same physical size as a USB 2 or USB 1 connector. So you know, pretty much um, anything mainstream in the past oh, four or five years is going to be uh, using a USB 3. Uh, there's maybe some legacy USB 2 gear out there, uh, but it will interoperate. So USB 3 gear is a good bet. Um, thinking about the other two connection types, Thunderbolt is a step up in speed and performance, uh, as well as cost. Um, that on the road is you know, probably uh, a little bit of overkill. Uh, unless you're doing something with very large amount of images or you're involved it's, in it's not overkill for a video or time lapse. <laughs> well, I was just going to say, I was just starting to say video. Uh, yeah, so that's uh, one thing to yeah. uh, think about. 
And certainly that's great back. But it probably won't work at the business center. <laughs> no. 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 And, Ken, and Ken brought up that same point. He said, that, you know, the hotel he was at, the business center was very slow. So, yes, mileage will vary depending upon where you're at. Uh, other places would be Kinko's sometimes. They, had, they tend to have slightly better machines at FedEx offices because they actually have those loaded up with Adobe software and people will do desktop design there. So you can consider that. Or even, believe it or not, libraries often have computers that are accessible in markets. Um, now, Mark, USB-C is a newer standard, and uh, we're seeing this on Apple computers. It's also the same connection type as Thunderbolt 3. I think people have a little bit of confusion there on the difference between USB-C and Thunderbolt 3. Can you tackle that for us? Okay, so there's uh, two things here. You know, one is the physical connector. And that's the USB-C, and you know, I'm sure we've all seen we know somebody who has a MacBook. We've seen it uh, on display somewhere. So the USB-C is this again, this little uh, you know connector that uh, has a benefit of being omnidirectional. You know, it will automatically sense uh, you know which directions it's in, so it will just uh, you know the, uh, the the data lines accordingly. You know, based on each side that it uh, connects to. So, in plain English, the plug can't. It doesn't have an upside down. It goes in either direction. For those of us who fumble in the dark, that's right. You know, same thing. Or for people if they have iPhones that have the Lightning connector for, oh, I think for the for past four maybe five years that Apple's had, it's yeah. just it just plugs in one way and it doesn't matter. You know, electronically it will figure out uh, which you know, you know which uh, data should go on which pin. So, you know, that's a great aid. Uh, the other thing about USB-C is it's uh, sort of uh, you know, emerging going to the future. Uh, you know, it's a thinner device. You know, the only Apple product that it has is a MacBook. There are several PCs that uh, are also, you know, sort of in the ultra-thin uh, form factor. They're starting to use a uh, USB-C. The new uh, GoPro I actually use it, actually. And GoPro, okay, I didn't know that. So I expect this is going to pick up you know, going into the future. Uh, the other benefit is... Uh, it new, some of the newer Intel chipsets will support both uh, the Thunderbolt protocol and USB-C protocol. And this will be great because you can all use cables interchangeably. Now, we have to be careful that part of the reason Thunderbolt cables cost $50 is it's not that uh, you know, Apple is uh, double downing on attacking your wallet. It's because there's a lot of silicon in that. Even though it, you think it's a cable, uh, there's a chip at each end that basically maintains uh, the single amplitude and eliminates noise. That's necessary in order to get such high transfer rates. USB-C does not have that. So, uh, you know, depending on uh, your device, you might be able to plug a Thunderbolt you know, cable into, uh, you know, into a USB device you know, data will transfer just fine. If you do it the other way, if you plug a Thunderbolt uh, device, you know, in using a USB-C cable, it will operate, but at dramatically reduced speed. You know, this harkens back, I'm sure we've all seen things in the past where we've maybe had uh, firewire devices daisy chained and, you know, there's a firewire, was once a firewire 400 that pulled everything down, or we see similar things with networking, where you have a gigabit ethernet and you maybe have a slower, you know, 100 big ethernet and it suddenly pulls the speed down, you'll start to see the same sort of thing relative to the cable. So that's something as an industry that as more and more gets, gear gets out there, people, you know, will experience this problem and then collectively we'll all learn what the response is. But that's a little bit of theoretical concern looking forward. You know, the bottom line, you know, given all of that as an education, if you're on the road, the best bet for versatility will be USB 3. Okay, it's going to work in the most places. Now, when you are on the road, it's very important to keep this gear safe. And uh, we've got a couple of strategies here. I'm sure Levi will have a few to share as well. First up, soft cases to keep everything well padded. These look less obtrusive. They're very easy. I find that, like, let's say I'm getting on an airplane, and all of a sudden I'm on one of those commuter jets, and they're like, oh, you can't do this. Your bag won't fit. You'll have to check it. Well, very quickly. And even if it's the middle of the summer, I always bring a light jacket with very deep pockets. I start pulling these guys out, drives and stuffing them in. Amazon has a whole series of soft cases like this. And so if everything's loose, you're screwed. But if you've got everything in all these little tiny bags, all of a sudden you're grabbing stuff, you're shoving it in, and your laptop's in a sleeve, you pull it out. My bag can be disassembled. Like if I were to dump out my laptop bag or my camera bag, 
there's very few loose items. I could basically triage and start grabbing pieces and shoving it in pockets. And in that bag, I'll also put a smaller soft bag, just one of those uh, shopping bags that you would have uh, to go to like the reusable grocery store bags so that I could start shoving stuff in. Oh, Levi, you even have one. Go for it, dude. Am I stealing your thing? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. The Drobo even That's comes with idea. one, by the way. <laughs> yeah, the Drobo comes with one. And th this, is, this is my lens baby one, but I put my Drobo in it to take it back and forth from the studio. <laughs> Yeah, so the, so things like that, so you don't have to panic, are pretty important. The Pelican cases are important for bigger gear. Uh, Mark, you can actually take a five bay Drobo on the road if you were doing a big long term job, right? In a Pelican case. Yes, I think the thing to do is buy Pelican case fifteen ten, and make sure you buy the foam insert for it because that is pre scored. And what you can do is you can c create a little compartment that you can put the. Looks like we might have lost Mark there. Well, there he is. Go ahead, Mark. Is uh, you know also you can pull out uh, some of the foam to create little nesting slots for each of the drives as well as the power supply. So by doing it this way, you know you'll have the Drobo fully within uh, you know, within the hard side case within uh, the soft foam with inside as well as the drives are going to be inside. So that protects very 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 well against uh, shock and vibration and and dropping and uh, you know all sorts of uh, you know, crazy things. Uh, I know I've been very several, several times through airports where you check it and when you get on the receiving end, uh, you can see, you know, open it up and you have this little card that this was inspected by TSA. So uh, one of the other benefits I think of having a proper fixture is if the authorities do need to visually inspect it for some reason, uh, for them it's easy to open and then reconstruct. Uh, they don't have to, uh, you know, just throw stuff back in and hope it gets in the right place. And, you know, if they damage it, they damage it and it's on you. So um, right. you know, that's why I think we all love uh, Pelican cases. I, I think a general thing about this uh, idea, even with the soft cases, is make sure it's an easy way to keep everything together and in order. Uh, in addition to carrying on shop on baskets, a uh, thing I like is uh, not to give a particular plug, but a Scotty vest. And those are great for travel because they have, you know. Nothing says nerd like a Scotty vest. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Pockets that uh, you put stuff into. Yeah. I have, a, I have a nice guy hack for this too, Rich. Yep. <laughs> when, when you're getting on the plane and they say, your bag is not going to fit, you need to check it at the bottom of the thing. Go ahead and tank the tag that they give you, but then then walk onto the plane and say to the first flight attendant you see, you say, hey, I, I understand that my my bag may not fit in the overhead. It usually fits under the seat, but but in case it doesn't, it's all my photography gear. And I wonder if you could help me out and maybe put it in your closet if it doesn't fit in at my seat. And I've never been turned down. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but you're you're charming and cute, and that works better for you than some of us. But you know, but, but being nice just, doesn't hurt. Just stoop a little, Rich. You're you're <laughs> like eight feet tall, so just stoop a little. <laughs> being being nice doesn't hurt, and sometimes paying extra for the early boarding is not a bad idea either. If you're traveling with gear, right? Uh, so you know, and if you're traveling and it's really crazy, I've seen people pay extra for the seat next to them and just put the gear there and strap it in. Yeah. Now, uh, Ken mentioned the bag. What bag. doesn't work? Yeah. Oh yeah. Go ahead. What doesn't work is saying, this is photography gear and it cannot be checked. Yes. Yes. <laughs> like, and and, I, and I find that, that assigning a price tag to that also doesn't no. impress them. But this is $30,000 no, of matter. equipment. They're like, well, you're a fool. Yeah. So. <laughs> it doesn't, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, Ken suggested Case Logic makes an overhead bag that has a compartment that pulls out. I've got a similar one from the, the Swiss Army folks. And uh, actually, I have one for uh, an insert for the folks at Timbuktu. Same idea where the bag breaks down. So look for things like that. Yeah. Uh, Low Pro also does it. Now, carry on versus check. You have to be prepared for that conversion. Make sure you've done some triage ahead of time that you know what you're going to take out. For me, it's going to be laptop, camera body, memory cards, and then, you know, lenses people aren't as attracted to. But, you know, make your own decisions. Uh, and then Think about removing those drives versus leaving them in place. Mark, if you have a unit with removable drives, uh, Levi already gave us a tip of, you know, with his Drobo Mini, putting one in one place and one in the other because it's already got the data backed up. Do you have any suggestions, Mark, on why you might want to remove drives if they're in a removable casing? Yes, yeah, so probably for a couple of reasons. Number one, 
uh, you want to eliminate damage you know, that occurs if the unit is dropped, so any shock or vibration damage. Uh, number two, you really don't know what the environmental condition is going to go into, so you have better control if you pull it out. And if you do this, I recommend, uh, certainly at a minimum, you know, go get a bunch of those Ziploc uh, sandwich bags and put the drive in it and seal it because you want to protect it against uh, exposure to humidity. Uh, and also, this is a great travel trip if you're traveling with multiple drives when you're you know, on location. Keep them in a sealed, uh, you know, just to uh, sealed bag to protect them against environment. And if you can get them, or when you first get the drive, they come with that little, you know, you know moisture absorbent silica gel. Just keep that pack and uh, put it in there, because uh, you know moisture is the enemy of a hard drive. Do Do you think it's important to keep it in the ESD bag that that uh, static discharge bag that the drives come in? Is that is that essential, or is it okay to just put it in a Ziploc bag? That to me, that's secondary. You know, ideally, the thing to do is keep the uh, anti-static bag, and there it depends on the nature of the location. Are you going somewhere where, uh, you know, is it going to be a hot or a dry environment where dry just by yeah. walking that you're subject to get you know static electricity? You know, certainly, if you know you're in an environment where you walk and you touch the door handle and you get that static discharge. You want to make sure that, uh, you know, in a case like that, you're also protecting your hard drive and all your other equipment, too. All right. Well, when we're in the field, one of the things that's important is to make a verified backup copy. And this is a concept that a lot of people are not familiar with. It's very important that you actually have a verified copy. And there's a couple of ways of doing this. Uh, one, there's a Mac utility called Carbon Copy Cloner. And uh, on the Windows side, Mark, what's another uh, utility that does a verified copy that's affordable? Oh, this it's so affordable. I think it's like forty or forty-five dollars. It's a it's backup tool called SyncBack Pro. Uh, there's another one called Acronis. Uh, I understand from some of my Windows friends. I think they're partial to SyncBack Pro because it's a little easier to set up and uh, manage. Okay. Uh, another one, if you are Adobe Creative Cloud customer, is Adobe Prelude, and I want to show this really quick. Uh, this is a tool that not everybody's familiar with, but I, but I like this one actually quite a bit. Let me just, uh, come on, screen share. <laughs> I'm trying to get my screen to share. Uh, let me switch back here. And uh, what I'm going to show you is uh, how this can be pretty simple. Let me just share my screen. One second, folks. Sorry. And, and is, that, uh, is that for creative, like photographer's bundle, or do you have to have no, the full suite? You have, you have to have the full suite for this one. Um, but well, you know, those other utilities are going to work as is. And uh, this one's very robust. It's actually a dedicated utility from Adobe whose sole purpose is to copy media and keep it safe, which uh, a lot of people don't know that this tool exists. So it's called Adobe Prelude. And what happens is, is you launch it and it allows you to put in footage and video and photos. And essentially what you need to do is tell it okay, here's the card, and there's a whole ingest workspace here. So what you can do is say, take it from this place and transfer to these places, and you'll notice that you can add multiple locations. So you can add several destinations, up to like six, and you can have oh, wow. it with subfolders in with dates. If it's video files, it can compare. Uh, it can convert, and it even allows for different types of verification. So, MD5 file size in bit by bit. Mark, can you explain those in sort of everyday terms? It's basically like good, better, best, right? For like verifying that what you copied was actually copied. So, the, the idea here is you want to make sure that uh, you know, the source file and the copy are the same you know otherwise you know sometimes copy jobs fail and you may only you know get half your image or half your data or the other more subtle thing is if parts of it you know, are corrupted i'm sure we've all seen jpeg images where you open it up and you only see the top of the image or everything has a you know, purplish tint or something so those are three different ways that uh, they will do the comparison the file size, basically, they look to say, okay, well, they say you have the same number of bytes. That's good enough. That's sort of like the minimum level. Uh, the other two, MD5 and checking bit by bit, those will 
give you better security and confidence that the data is the same. However, it's going to uh, take longer to do it because it needs to copy the data over first and then it has to read it again in order to uh, you know, compute one of those uh, one of those functions in order to you know be able to basically fingerprint the data on both sides and look at them and say, yep, the fingerprint matches, it's fine. So uh, again, this goes back to what's at stake yeah, is uh, you know, is this for fun? Is this for profit? Um, but, uh, you know, it certainly is of, of good practice. Uh, you know, the little known story is the original instance, you know, uh, you know, impetus for you know, the founder of uh, Drobo years ago was he was using a RAID 1 you know, situation to mirror his honeymoon pictures. You know, the original drive and the RAID setup, you know, that had them, it developed corruption. He thought, oh, that's no problem. I'll just read them off the other. But because it was a mirrored situation, it just mirrored junk. So, you know, that's why, you know, higher levels of uh, protection are necessary. And same sort of situation here, just because a copy gets made, uh, you know, in the enterprise world, people will tell you that uh, the biggest cause of uh, corruption is something goes wrong with a copy. There might be, you know, flaky memory in the computer or server. There might be environmental noise. You know, the lightning, you know, that you were talking about earlier, Rich, these are all things that can go wrong to impact uh, the integrity of the copy. So I have a question again. You know, it wasn't clear you know, to me. Maybe you could describe again how is uh, how is Adobe Prelude uh, purchased and accessed? Sure. So if you have a full version of Adobe Creative Cloud, uh, you can get Prelude. Uh, they do. If you don't want to buy that tool, Red Giant also makes some copy utilities that do verification. And there's Shotput Pro from another company. Those are all similar products that do these verified copies to multiple destinations and other such. So you can look at any of those, but for that, you'll need the full Creative Cloud plan. That's the one that's $49 a month US. Now, Levi, you're gonna show a really cool workflow here about making a dedicated catalog in Lightroom. So one of the things a lot of folks don't know is if you're on the road, uh, Levi, if you wanna get your screen shared and uh, get set up to show this, this would be awesome. Uh, what you can do is you can actually make a smaller dedicated catalog for that client or the job so that you can go ahead and keep it all organized, make any basic edits or get your flags or your selects or any essential things that you need. And then you can either write to the sidecar files or if you convert it to DNGs, then a lot of those edits would be tucked right into the files. Uh, remember, convert to DNG is an option. And then when you get back to your computer, you can actually then merge this smaller catalog into a larger catalog. Well, Levi, that's just the quick summary, but why don't you walk folks through how this workflow actually works? Because I think a lot of folks think, well, I can't do anything because I have to wait till I get back to my main computer for Lightroom. Yeah, no, it's, it's super simple. And because, because many of us travel with a laptop and have a desktop at home, and you want your, your main catalog on your desktop, and I highly recommend I strongly recommend, if I was Scott Bourne, I would say times a hundred million thousand times recommend that you use one catalog. Um, I spent a, the last couple of days helping a friend consolidate her catalogs and it, it became really troublesome because she's she's been using multiple catalogs for different clients and things and having one is just so much simpler. And so what, what I would do if I'm using my laptop on the road, I would just create a new catalog. And that's what I did for my friend Megan and Mark. We went and photographed some wedding portraits for him. So I created a catalog and it's called Megan and Mark LR Cat. And so when I'm using this catalog, it's just got their pictures in it. Um, but I want to reconcile that with my main catalog back at the studio now. So what we do, we just go to Lightroom and you go up to the file menu and you choose import from another catalog. And then you navigate to where that is. I've got it stored on my Drobo, which is called Marvin. And then you just click on the name of the catalog and click choose. And it pops, oh, cannot import. It's, we might have to, uh, it might be because I, I switched let me quit Lightroom real quick, no and then we'll... The steps are right there, though. So The steps are right there. That's it. All you do, and, and then you just press OK. 
and it imports your pictures. It imports all the changes you've made to your photographs and it imports your collections as well, which is really important because if I've created collections for the portraits and for the reception and for the, uh, the ceremony, then I want to have those still with me. Um, and so importing from the catalog carries everything over and it's so great. And, Let's try this one more time. Yep. And while he's getting that set up, folks, remember, you also have a command inside of Lightroom uh, to write the metadata back to the sidecar files or to the files. So you can actually force it to write the metadata outside of the catalog and put it in sidecar files next to it. So even if the catalog were to become corrupt, all the edits, the selects, and the information could be stored next to it. Levi, do you remember where that command is hidden? It's kind of buried, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, since I can't show you the other thing, let me show you where that is. Um, uh, right right is, now, we're not seeing your screen, Levi. We're seeing you in the dark, just so you know. Oh, you're not? Yep. Oh. So share your screen. Sorry about that. No problem. It's very Let's moody lighting. <laughs> Good. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, the uh, webcam thing quits every time I switch screens. Here we go. Okay. We still see you. Thank you. There we go. And go ahead. There we go. Okay. Here we are. So back in... In, um, in Lightroom, you want to go up to your preferences, which on a Mac is, is under the Lightroom menu. On a PC, it's under the Edit menu. And you go to the Preferences, and then right here under General, nope, under File Handle, nope. Yep. <laughs> under, is it right here? I think so. I thought it was too. And that's where you can embed, that's the JPEGs. So let's see here, Presets, Insert, no, that's the, probably yeah. under general. They hide it. It's. I think it's under general. Yeah, yeah. it's right. No, that's not it. Rats. <laughs> Sorry about that. I thought it was right there too. You'll find it. Where's Where's Rob? Yeah. Rob's my uh, Rob's my guy. We may have to post it. Well, Levi, as your publisher, I'm going to assign you a homework assignment. Yes. Of writing a blog <laughs> post on this for everyone. Uh, but I, I also think it's under it's under it's going to be under the file menu in Lightroom. You can also force it to manually do it, Levi, with images selected. So go ahead and close your preferences. Oh, here it is. No, here it is. It's under it's under catalog settings. Okay. And and um. And so it's it's under the catalog preferences, not the not the main preferences. And just right here, you under the metadata tab, you check automatically write changes into XMP. And what that'll do is it creates a sidecar file, which is an, an extra little file that sticks with your photograph. And any of the changes you've made to a photograph in Lightroom will then carry with it. Because when you make a change in Lightroom, you're not actually changing your photograph. You, those changes don't exist until you export the photograph with those with those new settings. And so creating this sidecar file makes an extra little file called a .xmp file that sticks with your picture and allows Lightroom to um, interpret those changes no matter where, no matter whose Lightroom you view it in. So I could send you my picture with the sidecar files and you could see it on your computer. Now, alternatively, if you're using the DNG format, which I which I do favor, so when I import my pictures, I change them to DNG, then those changes are written into the DNG format, and it's not an extra file. So I kind of prefer that. I like to have the DNG format, which has my raw file and the sidecar changes built all into one. Very cool. Okay, Levi, could you summarize just again for everybody? When they should you be using you know, sidecar files? When do you always. do it? <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, always. So, so I would go go to Lightroom right now and go to the catalog settings and under the metadata tab, check this box. It is not normally checked, um, and it it allows you to have the changes, the edits you've made in your Lightroom catalog carry along with them, including metadata, including changing the exposure. Anything you do in Lightroom doesn't exist unless you save it to a sidecar file. And that can be handed off to other Adobe apps too, like Photoshop or After Effects right. or others. Now, I actually do something very similar using Adobe Bridge. What I like is that before I've even transferred things to the computer, sometimes I'll pop a memory card in and do a really quick edit or need to send something off to a client. And so Bridge is included with the Creative Cloud Photography Plan. A lot of people wrote it off, but Bridge is actually back under active development at Adobe. 
It has engineers working on it, and it allows you to make edits. I personally find myself using it a lot when I'm in a hurry. I use Lightroom to keep an organized catalog, but if I just have some images on a drive or a memory card that I need to make edits, I can use Camera Raw. It will also save to sidecar files, saves to DNG, and makes it pretty simple to then merge these things into a larger catalog because that XMP metadata is there. So let me show you what this looks like in Bridge. You get all the stuff that you want and you can do everything that you do in Lightroom. For example, you know I can select multiple raw images here and I can open them. And I get the same control that I would in Lightroom. Slightly different user interface, but everything is here. So if I need to you know, work on this, and this is a very dusty desert day, and I say, you know what? Let's go ahead and dehaze that a little bit, and let's tweak the exposure, and you know, I'm getting there. Oh, and I realize I have a little sensor spot. All that stuff can be fixed. Everything's there. And a lot of people don't realize that it's all the same, that everything you can do in Lightroom is in Bridge. Plus, you can even select multiple images and invoke the merge to HDR command or merge to panorama if you're doing things like that. So this is a series of bracketed HDR, and I could just invoke that and create the DNG. Plus, what I like is that when I invoke a batch process here under save images, I can actually control what they get written out to and then go right over to other images and keep working. It's very responsive. So it's nice that you have all that flexibility and it too will automatically create the sidecar files. So if you don't want to make a catalog just to import things in and you just want the flexibility of doing quick edits on the road, I find that Bridge is very responsive. Levi, you, you have a question? That's really cool. So yeah, no, yeah, no I, I didn't I didn't know we could do the DNG HDR in, in Bridge like we can in Lightroom. Everything is here and it's actually personally I think a little bit faster than Lightroom at times. Uh, even though it's the same under the, core could, under, the, uh, under the hood core, what I like is if you click down here, you've got all these batch processing for sharpening and output. And if I were to invoke an output and I click done, it's going to run in the background. Then I can immediately go and start working on other stuff. So everything's here. You can modify metadata. You can make edits. You can check all your specs. You can see everything that you've been working on. And, uh, you know, there's nothing different. You know, if you were to open that up in Camera Raw with the right click, it's going to do exactly what you want it to, which is very cool. And it even makes it easier to run Camera Raw on a wide range of file formats, not just some of the ones that you would naturally put into Raw. All right, well, let me stop that screen share. we got a few more things to cover here today. Uh, one of the things is, is just some practical advice for working on the road. And uh, those of you that have been popping in questions, we really appreciate those questions coming in. We are going to give away a couple copies of software here at the end. So thanks there. Uh, Andrew, I agree with you. Bridge has gotten more stable and solid recently. It's because they put people on it finally. Um, with working on the road, uh, backing up edits to the cloud. So a lot of times, if it's important, if I've done some editing, I'll save a final image or a PSD or my sidecar files up to the cloud. That way, I can pull it down. Now, we had somebody ask about Backblaze. Uh, I use CrashPlan. Um, Mark, you can even remotely access your Drobo, right, with Drobo Access, if you've got a Drobo 5N? Yes. So uh, on the Drobo network Drobos, Drobo 5N or 810N, uh, <clears throat> you can install a you know, set of Drobo apps so that you can get access to it uh, from anywhere in the world. Uh, the module called Drobo Access allows you to share data. Uh, it's sort of like your private lock, uh, Dropbox. You can send somebody a link and they can download a file. You can somebody a send somebody a link and they can download it uh, out of a folder. Uh, similarly, you can allow them to upload into a folder so that uh, maybe this is good for team collaboration. Uh, you, had some, you had some Olympic photographers using this during the last games, right? I was just going to go into that. You know, uh, Jeff Cable, who was an Olympic photographer, uh, he used this from Rio that uh, each night, his view of the very best photos of the day, he uploaded you know, from uh, Rio to uh, his uh, studio in the Bay Area in California, uh, that his very best photos that he wanted to uh, you know, make sure that he saved. Um, wow. We're, about, uh, we're recording this about a week or in a couple days before PPE Photo Plus Expo. 
Uh, Jeff Cable will be at the Drobo booth uh, each day uh, during the show. So anyone who's listening today or people who listen between now and, uh, uh, you know, the Photo Plus, you know, if you're in New York at the Javits Center, please come on by and, uh, you know, he can uh, share some of his experiences uh, talking about, uh, you know, using this tool. Excellent. And actually, besides Drobo being at Photo Plus, Photo Focus will be as well. We have our first booth ever at Photo Plus, and we'll have theater uh, giving demos. Levi, myself, Robert Vanelli, uh, Joe McNally is going to be stopping by. Uh, the team from Plotograph Pro showing the new animated photos. So if you are in the area, feel free to come by. We've also posted links on our website so you can get a free show floor pass. Now, Levi, I believe you also use Smugbug while on the road, right? I do. I, I upload my favorite pictures, my, my besties each day to SmugMug also. And it's, um, I like it because it comes right from Lightroom and I can just create a collection in Lightroom and publish it. Um, it does create a JPEG of those pictures, but they're ready. They're, they're saved. You know, they're, they're backed up. It's a full resolution JPEG. And if, if the worst happens, I've still got those available to me, my, my favorites. Um, I could, you know, I could do all of them, but they're, they're JPEGs and it's, it's, uh, just, a for, for me, it's the last, the, the least safe method, but it's there. Yes. It's, um, <laughs> it's the least good thing. It's, it's something. Yeah. And remember, if you do have it's Lightroom yeah. and the creative cloud plan, you actually do have some cloud backup. Uh, officially, they haven't set a limit on what you can upload. Now, it's going to tend to put smaller RAW, a, a more compressed DNG, but that's still often good enough for a lot of the things that clients are going to need. Uh, you can use, of course, things like Dropbox and lots of other services. Uh, we mentioned Drobo Access. These all allow you to make sure you're doing some sort of backup. And I think really the bottom line here is it's impossible for most scenarios to back up everything. But if you're browsing your pictures, which is a good thing to do when you're on the road anyway, so you don't keep repeating mistakes. Oh, wow, there was, you know, sensor dust uh, on that sensor or that sensor needs to be cleaned and you missed it while you were shooting. Well, you don't want to shoot for a week and then discover a spot on your lens that you could have fixed the first night. But while you're doing that, you can make some selects and back those up. Uh, you also may need to share files with others that you're collaborating with. Drobo access is nice that way so that, you know, as big as your Drobo is, that's how big your cloud storage is. You don't have to pay extra for a Dropbox account, but there are other options out there and lots of ones for backing up. Now, a couple... I love it, too. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. I, I've, I've been using the 5N, and I love it also because my pictures are accessible when I'm on the road. Invariably, a client calls me while I'm traveling and says, hey, I need that, that picture for a, for a press release tonight. Do you have it? And since it's on my 5N, I do have it. I've got access to it. So what, what would cool. you say there is, yes, I'll call my assistant back in the office and have them pull that. It makes you sound bigger. <laughs> it's, it's right. a yeah, virtual exactly. assistant. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. Well, a couple pieces of advice uh, on the road. These are just some practical things that I've learned the hard way. Uh, one is, is hotel safety. Um, hotels are varying degrees of safe. One of the things that I recommend is, you know, make sure, consider using things like putting on the do not disturb sign on your hotel. You might need to tell the front desk, no, really, I'm sure I didn't want the room cleaned, you know, and uh, yeah, really, I'm yeah. sure there's no dead bodies up here, you know, because after two, three days, they get pretty persistent. Although some, <laughs> some hotels are actually giving you bonus nights if you, for every night you don't have your hotel room cleaned, they give you extra uh, hotel, uh, hotel points. Um, wow. Wow. With foreign travel, make sure you think about, you know, safety. What equipment are you going to lock up? When I leave the room, I try to make sure that either the laptop is coming with me and the hard drives are going in the safe, or I travel with that ultra lightweight tablet. Try to minimize the amount of equipment you leave out. I'll also tuck things, you know, behind the bed or under the bed or put it in a bag inside of a suitcase up on a shelf. You know, don't just leave everything on the countertop. Uh, in the old days, we used to have security cables, but then people like Apple decided that that was a port and ports are evil. So they took the security cable slot out. So it's <laughs> harder and harder to lock things down. With power variations, you might need to travel with an inverter or a converter. It's not enough just to have an adapter. Uh, now, a lot of times laptops can handle this, but it's very important that if you are going to be traveling internationally that you're familiar. Just adapting to the plug may not be enough because the power standards can differ. And when you're traveling through the airport, 
minimize how much you stuff in one bag. Be prepared to pull things out. Now, I've gone with the TSA Pre and actually the Global Traveler, and that makes it worlds easier on this. But Levi, besides being nice and smiling and engaging the TSA people, what are your other strategies to avoid trouble as you travel through an airport? Um, put the put things that look strange. So, so for some reason, a Platypod Pro mm -hmm. gets me searched more than anything else. <laughs> it's just a disc, a flat plate of metal. But they're not used to seeing a flat plate of metal in there. Right. And so, um, <clears throat> you, you know, you take that out and put it in the in the bin instead of leaving it in your bag, and that'll save you ten minutes in the search line. Um, Here, here's mine. I put all my cables into one see-through bag exactly. and put that right. in the bin so that when they look at my thing on the scanner, they don't see 15 different cables and wires because that looks a lot like a bomb, folks. Right. <laughs> one, one other thing that I like to do, uh, this, this is my, my small USB 3.0 hard drive, and I've put Velcro on the back of it, just two little strips of Velcro, and then I've got Velcro on the lid of my laptop as well. And so when I'm sitting on the plane – or even when I'm sitting at home on, on the couch, the, the drive is stuck to the top of the laptop so I can't accidentally knock it off the table and lose the transfer I'm in the middle of or, or anything else. It also saves you a lot of space on the tray table on the airplane. More, more room for those bad peanuts. All right, well, our last, right. our last thing to cover today is our 321 backup on the go. And Mark, we're gonna rely heavily on you here. Uh, this is very important that we keep our stuff safe. So. You know, 321 means three copies. You're going to want to have at least two hard drives with you. And maybe that other copy is going to be the original media, right, Mark? Like, you know, we can have three copies by just going to two hard drives and keeping the cards. That's right. So the, the idea there in the studio is 321, three copies of your data, two different devices locally, and one off site. So if we adapt this for travel, you still want to have three copies of the data, you know, two two different de devices that could be one, the original card could be a hard drive or could be two separate hard drives. And then one that is, uh, you know, preferably, you know, offsite or maybe with somebody else in the party. Again, here you need to vary it a little bit depending on how large the job is and whether it's for money or whether it's for fun. But that one last thing is uh, make sure that you have something with you so that if uh, your check baggage, uh, you know, you know, gets lost and sent to the wrong place, or if somebody you know, inadvertently you know, you know takes something out of uh, the checked overhead, you know, you're still uh, in possession of uh, your final copy of the data. Very good advice. And remember, you can upload those most important images to the cloud. Not a bad idea. Two other things to consider. One is shipping making a copy yeah. and not putting it on the airplane with you or on the train with you, but actually shipping the drive. Now, if you're concerned, uh, there are actually hard drives out there that come with encryption. Uh, I've got one from Western Digital. Seagate makes this. It actually has right on the drive software. So when you plug the drive in, you have to enter a passcode to unlock the drive. If you put it on a new machine, it asks you to install this unlock software. I've used the one from Western Digital, but we have some of those to, to make it simple. That comes in handy. Uh, Western Digital also makes hard cases like this that actually have the USB port integrated. You can close this up, and this is you know basically like a Pelican case, and inside is a standard uh, Western Digital hard drive. And you'll see there that we've actually put a business card taped to it. So if the package were to get destroyed or lost, this hard drive is in its own Pelican type case, ready for travel. And that's going to really keep things safe. GTEC makes some ruggedized drives like that as well. This is what we use to ship because this can get the heck banged out of it. Uh, and it's going to really hold together. Another option is, is just uh, consider, you know, having multiple people carry them. So, you know, if you're going to travel at different times, a lot of times on big jobs, we'll put people on different planes or we'll travel at different times. You know, maybe the one person travels back right away, but somebody's going to stay for a day later. Consider spreading that data out or even leaving a copy behind with the client or leaving a copy behind with a trusted friend until you get back to the office and then having them ship it. That way, if your bags got stolen, and you know, or you lost your bag, and you lost the version you were traveling with, and both are down, you could say to that other person, hey, before you put this in the mail, let's make another copy. <laughs> you know, let's make another copy before we ship it. it. It gives you that safety net. 
All right, well, we talked about a lot today with Safe Storage on the Road. I hope you guys enjoyed this webinar. We appreciate you having you here. We're going to give away a couple of quick prizes here in a second. Um, for everybody, though, who's watching this or the replay, what you can do is if you would like to save $100 on a Drobo, uh, that is the five bay units or the eight bay units, you can use the code PF100, and this will save you $100. And we've had other webinars in the past. Uh, I use Drobos all the time, both in my studio and with my personal photography. It's the safest way for me to keep my copies on multiple drives and redundancy, great performance. So you can check that out. And thanks to them for sponsoring this webinar. Uh, and of course, you can head on over to Photo Focus where you can learn a lot more from our great authors like Levi and others. So Levi, any parting advice or information you want people to know? Oh, just that this is worth doing. <laughs> I, when I, when I started, I, I started using all these little drives and, and I had, I had the, the, my, or whatever the Western digital, my, I think it's my book drives on the, on my desktop. And I had like six of these things laid out there and then they switched to USB three and I had to get faster drives. And now I've got all this, these old drives that I don't use anymore. It, it has been so much simpler for me since I started using a system like Drobo. There, there's other systems out there too, but I really like that Drobo, we just plug it in and it works. And that that gives me so much peace of mind because I'm not a naturally fastidious person in this way. I am the worst about backing up. And so all of these systems that we've talked about today, once set up, allow me to be, um, lazy about it and that's good for me i don't have to think about it and that's so much better for uh people like me and i think a lot of creatives are kind of like me <laughs> awesome mark any other parting advice things that you want people to know yes i think the the purpose here is really to avoid losing data and there's one dimension we've spoken a lot about hardware and hardware solutions i think is just as important is it, us, you know, we, I think, are the weakest link. I've had many hard drive failures. I've never lost data to a hard drive failure, but I've lost data just to my own fat thumbs. So that's why it's, I think, is important you know, to get in the process and develop tools uh, and make sure that the tools are automated. So as you're looking at some of the tools to do backups or backup in multiple places, make sure that those are configured and they will just run flawlessly because if you're out and you're tired, you're going to make a mistake and you want that to be, you know, you're just leaving uh, your, you know, your shaving kit in the hotel room, not something that's really right. going to cost you data. So, you know, that's another dimension that uh, is really important that everyone should take a look at. Excellent. Well, we have shared a lot of different pieces of practical advice on this webinar. Uh, in all seriousness, if you missed any of it, go back and watch it or even consider watching it again. If you travel a lot, there are so many things that are easy to screw up. Now, uh, we want to give away a couple of prizes here. Uh, Vicky DeVico uh, and Ken Tenenbaum, you guys each get a copy of Perfectly Clear Complete. Uh, they just announced that they're hard at work on version three. So right now, anybody who buys version two is going to get version three for free. Uh, but uh, just drop Levi a line at Levi at photofocus.com. So Ken and Vicky, thank you for checking in and your comments today. And for everybody who posted comments, uh, we do have a great book, uh, ebook that is currently, uh, we set it to 99 cents. Although if you do a search on our website, uh, you'll find it and you can look for the Drobo ebook. It's a, a book all about Lightroom and storage workflows. And we'll put that in with a follow-up post on this. It covers how to keep your images organized in Lightroom. And that's normally a $20 book and we've lowered the price to a dollar. But if you poke it on our website, we actually have a, a story or two that gives you a free link, you might find it. We gave that away in our last e-newsletter as well. So make sure you sign up for the Photo Focus newsletter. We frequently have goodies in there, uh, like eBooks and things that we send out for free. Well, thank you guys so much for tuning in today. My name is Rich Harrington. We covered a lot of great stuff today. And I appreciate you guys hanging in there with us and some great practical advice on how you can keep your images safe as a photographer while you're on the road.